as we live in turbulent times where the future is unpredictable and we all witness the rise and impact of technology in our daily lives, it is very imperative for an institution as BAC uh, to make sure that we roll out and grow the ICT agenda to be able to propel economic growth. As a key stakeholder in delivering the Vision 2016 for Sustainable Economic Development, we've provided quality and diversified human resources in accounting, business, management, tourism, hospitality, and ICT. Our collaborative partnerships has allowed us to produce market-relevant and ready graduates who are so competitive in the global arena. We actually boast of over 10,000 alumni in the market who are making significant and impactful contribution to the Botswana economy, the African economy, and the world at large. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you today as a proud BAC alumni that is in roads trying to make a difference. As we deliberate on the various fourth industrial revolution topics, drivers, information management, disruptive technologies, and ICT for sustainable development, I hope we can challenge ourselves though to make sure that these deliberations, we can do more research and come up with products and services that actually make a difference in our lives. It is my wish that the conversations will actually continue beyond this particular conference. Let this conference be a good start and a propeller for continuous learning and adoption of technology. Let us become leaders of leveraging ICT for economic growth. Director's ceremonies allow me to encourage the industry and academics here present this morning to ensure that they embrace the changes that come with the fourth industrial revolution. And even better, go ahead of the game. Be the change that you want. Distinguished guests, in today's economy, the use of ICT is very crucial in the efficient delivery of communication, goods, and automated services for both private sector and the government. The world is now connected together through mobile devices and applications such as social media. These devices are portable, but have amazing storage capacity and processing power. Using these emerging innovations, the world has made breakthrough in artificial intelligence, vehicle engineering, material science, robotics, and other fields such as quantum computing and nanotechnology, just to mention but a few. We must be mindful of the fact that the extent of which ICT can be leveraged to achieve sustainable economic development does not depend on the IC, just on the ICT infrastructure only, but also on human and institutional capacity to effectively innovate and use technologies. Currently, we are faced with youth unemployment in our country. But the question is why? It is upon us as educational institutions to review our education system, to review our syllabuses to make sure that we train for the markets. And I'm also confident that this conference will produce tangible results. <clears throat> On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I declare the Botswana Accountancy College first international ICT conference officially open. Thank you very much. For attention. Thank you very much. Information technology contributes largely to the sustainable and economic development, seeing as how everyone is connected and how everyone wants to heavily rely on these automated systems that deliver efficient services. And so it is for this reason that we should all join hands in continuous efforts to bring our country and the world the best ICT solutions that our women can offer. In my attempt to promote the girl, child, the girl child in ICT and give back to community, I proposed to BAC the Angela Matlapeng Award, AMA Award in short, 
that will be presented in appreciation and recognition of female students who managed to excel in ICT-related courses in tertiary schools despite these odds. The school has received... <laughs> The school has received it with quite enthusiasm and open hands, and I'd like to extend this project to all stakeholders in ICT to assist in sponsorship of the award, mentorship programs, sponsoring fellowships designed for women, and aiding in ICT industry certifications post-graduation. My dream is to have this award nationwide to include all women in the ICT courses in all tertiary schools. And now to all women that are gathered in this room today, I'd like to acknowledge your bravery, your determination. You are in the right space. You have so much to offer. Do not let this world box you into insignificance. Stand for and with each other as women in ICT. And when you've done the best, your deeds will speak louder than the gender itself. Aim for the moon so that when you miss, you land amongst the stars. Step out and step ahead. Thank you. ICT for sustainable development. That is the, the focus. Uh, for this conference, and hence it is also the focus for our panel discussion. We all are aware, or majority, or some of us, of the sustainable uh, development goals. Sustainable development goals as a follow-up to the millennium uh, set up within a horizon uh, 2030, looking at a number of areas. Uh, included uh, in, in those areas, we're looking at uh, food security, you know, climate change, you're looking at uh, innovation, uh, you're looking at uh, health security, to mention but a few. So the whole purpose of the conference is to try and address, share, in terms of you know, how we can leverage on ICT in order to drive you know, sustainable development. Our panelists uh, today will share with us and we'll share with them as you actually drive the discussion through your questions. Uh, they have a huge amount of expertise, a lot of experience, and hence we engage with them uh, in, uh, in that area. My interface when I moved into the NGO, NGO sector, when I was working with Achab, was to say, government has developed a policy of accessing government services online. What are going to be the access points? Because, because when they developed the policy, there had not been any prior thought in terms of how citizens are going to interface with government. So we work through the medium of the public libraries to say, well, actually, if you deploy ICTs, you deploy internet, you train librarians or library, all the employees and, and train public so that they have ICT skills. You now have a chance for people to be able to access um, that information from government at those places and for free. I mean, of course, bear in mind the, the cautionary tale that the prof has been saying in terms of cyber security and so forth. But I mean, we are talking now what? 10, 15 years later, almost. Libraries have trained people. They have trained people all over the country. I mean, over 100,000 trained at basic ICT skills. But we still don't have an interactive government portal. So even though we are developing skills at basic level, because policy, we've not thought through that policy can actually be a driver. It could be a push or it could be a pull factor. We need to decide where we want to place policy. In some aspects, perhaps we, we need to look at it as a pull factor. If government were to say, for instance, from now onwards, every school that we have in the class must have a minimum of 10 megabytes per second of internet connectivity. You know what that will do? So I think for me, when you look at sustainable, you should be looking at those things. So you look at ICT both as a tool to allow that access, but also as an industry, because once there is a demand for certain ICT services, then people such as the young lady, um, my neighbor uh, that spoke earlier, and others like her, would be able to develop uh, applications or software system to support and provide services in that space. 
And so for me, that's much more sustainable than say, well, let's train a thousand ICT graduates or engineers. Without them, what are they do next? Because I think we are all very good at what you want to achieve, but without saying, you know, what are the process, what are the key inputs that would allow us to move that way. But I think if I want to talk specifically, just briefly uh, to get to my end, in terms of Bitri, I mean, some of the things that we're looking at for instance is how do you get access to the last mile? I mean, we always talk about, you know, 4G, 3G, whatever, 5G, when you're in town. I mean, how about somebody in Biliqui? I mean, I won't talk about Donata because Donata is town, you know. <laughs> you know, somebody in Biliqui or somebody in Takatokan or some such places. How do they get access to either government cities when they are interactive or just basic internet? And so that's one of the challenges that we need to face because you, you don't want to continue and amplify the, the huge disparity between people who in town and people in, in the countryside. And so th that for me and for Bitra, I think those are the challenges. What, what, is, what options, what technologies are there that we could be exploited to, to provide that? Is satellite an option? You know, I want you to, to give me that. Is it an option? Hmm? Pardon? Okay. He says it is. But what else? I mean, the question is, at what cost? You know, are we prepared to make those investments? Are they sustainable? Because we are looking at sustainable development. So, I mean, there are other technologies that you look at. I mean, TV white spaces. You know, could it be the option? You know, you know use... Um, you know, the free, well, the, 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 the unregulated un, 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 uh, space uh, so that you can have access. Is it an option? I mean, something that we've worked with and we've tried out and see it works. But is it something that we should focus on as a strategic uh, uh, intervention as, as a country? Uh, and when you look at skills, because I mean, one of the challenges with sustainability is skills. Do we have the skills? I mean, I think it's, it's, you always have this thing where you say, well, do you, do you develop skills first or do you provide jobs? And which comes first? Uh, I, mean, I mean, industry might say, well, we have jobs, but we don't have people with the skills. Or we have, university will say, we have skilled people, but they're not being employed. So I think one of the interim measures that we've done as an institution is to look at, can we capacitate graduates from you know, ICT programs on computer science and related information management so that they can acquire industry skills, you know, programming, de software development. You train them through a program, a two-year program at Vitri to ensure, first of all, they acquire skills, but secondly, they develop their entrepreneurial skills because ultimately, it's not every single trained person that will be employed. So if you are not employed, you should leave the program with a skill, but also something that you could sell you know, a program that you develop, a system that you develop. So I think generally for me, that's what we want to look at. Look at policy, but not just policies. It should be, you should implement that policy such that you can correctively and iteratively develop as you move forward. I think the challenge with this country is sometimes we wait for perfect, but perfect doesn't exist. So I think for me, that's what I want to leave you with. Aren't we too, too enthusiastic about bringing out new things, making, technology workable, and I'm, in, I'm from Africa. I've been born in Africa, I lived here all my life. I've got no doubt about it, that technology will and can increase the African people and advance Africa as a continent. I've got no doubt about that. But I'm worried and I'm warning that we should be careful. Let me finish off with one example and then hand over to the other panelists. I've, I've taken task with some of the municipalities in South Africa with, with, who with bigger claim has said, we providing free Wi-Fi for everybody in the, in, the, in the city. Just log on to the free Wi-Fi provided by your friendly local municipality and you can do your banking and everything in there. And how many people are losing money because of that? Because suddenly they've got a phone, they can freely log on to the Wi-Fi without having any clue about the threats. And the hackers know that. They, wa they wait for you on that free Wi-Fi hotspot and they steal your money. And that's the point I'm trying to make is we must also start with our citizens, with our children, making them aware 
of this whole new fourth generation, fourth, rev uh, fourth industrial revolution, and with everything that's going to come, because everything is going to be more connected. We know that. We're going to have talks about the Internet of Things. Everything is going to be more connected. And the cyber criminals are going to be more connected into us. So let's think about that. That's, that's my passion. And that's what I like to get specifically from people from industry and from academia. How do, develop, how do we develop secure systems? And how do we prepare the users of our systems, the man in the street, so that he can be safe and use those systems secure? Think about that. Obviously, as, a, as an educator, um, I'm very keen on, on education and promoting uh, computer science and engineering and mathematics and, and all the, 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 what we call the STEM subjects, but also looking at uh, that, that much, much broader range, looking into the social sciences, into health sciences, into the humanities, because everybody needs to have digital skills. And that is part of our our real difficulty because we talk about digital skills and we think digital skills for who? Because yes, we've got to have people who can create apps and create systems and, and, and do cybersecurity and do digital audits and, and who are really at, the, at, that, at one end of the spectrum. But then we need to include everybody because there's a real opportunity around the, the digital agenda to, to include all of society and some people might not want to be a, a computer science or a digital uh, expert or an ICT expert, but their lives are going to be touched by ICT. So we've talked about e-government, we've talked about uh, moving from manual systems to, to uh, automated systems. Everybody has to be able to access things. So in the UK, for example, pensions, uh, and pensioners are told to go to a website to do, make a claim, to, to look at a, 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 an app or use the app to get access to uh, various uh, resources. And for some people, that's like a completely alien statement. They don't understand what's, what's meant. They don't understand what they've got to do. So it causes a real disparity between those who have skills and those who don't have skills. So we need to remember that it's not only about doing degrees, because degrees are very, very important, but it's about giving everyone in society the opportunity to engage with that, that digital agenda. However, we do, and as an educator, we do need to think about the, how we develop that uh, body of people who will do all the jobs that need to be done to create uh, do, you know, various different applications, various different op op opportunities, various different systems to maintain those systems, to upgrade those systems, to understand the infrastructure, to understand the, the, the interfaces, to understand how people are, are going to use and utilize the, the, these systems. Yes, we need to scale those people. Yes, we need more people. Yes, we need to, to address the gender balance. We need to encourage young people. Uh, my, my daughter's 12. I'm trying to encourage her to think about computer science. She doesn't want to know about it. Dad, I don't want to be like you. You know, I say, well, you won't be like me because I'll be retired and you'll be looking after me. Um, so it's encouraging people to, to, to think about embracing that, that, that challenge. And, it's, it's, and to, to say that it's not only a technical job, but it's a job that has a, a real impact on society. Then we move through to, to high school, to people who are thinking about going to college, to university, and to encourage them to get involved in, in, the, in, in the digital agenda. So they might be interested in psychology, they might be interested in languages, they might be interested in health sciences. Great, we need all of those people. But giving those people a digital background as well. Yeah, so they embrace the digital uh, agenda. So then when they come to talk to the technical people, they can talk. When they come to use the, the systems and applications that are developed, they can use them. They can move towards a sustainable future by utilizing and using the I ICT. The fact of the matter is our people are still lagging behind, especially the older folk. Now, my son, who can't read or write, he's four years old, knows, the, knows YouTube, WhatsApp, and basically how to navigate the, Nan the Android system. Now, how do we bridge the gap between, because now there's a disparity, because on the one side, 
There's my son who can read or write, but he can, he can, he can fiddle with the phone. And there's his grandmother who can read and write well, but doesn't know how to get around her applications and things like that. So how do we reverse engineer what's already been developed in order for the older generation to catch up? And how do we then uh, uh, slowly but surely um, uh, uh, walk with the young people so that they don't forget the, the, the foundation, which is a pen and a paper, for example? I think some, some of these things we should accept, that there are always going to be translators. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the one in the, the generation in the middle must do translation for both the, 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 the children and also the grandparents. And, and, and it's a role we should embrace because that's, that's the nature of, of life. Um, certainly, I mean, when, when we're working in the space of public libraries, I mean, there are people who would go and take, you know, these courses and learn about ICTs and bring their peers but the others will be reluctant. So those that are, you know, but I wouldn't say daring, but those that, you know, take the, the, the step, then become the link to that information. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because eventually you'll have enough pool of people that have access, even if maybe not directly through themselves, but through their, their friends uh, that are, I mean, essential core knowledge translators. Countries are talking about uh, 5G as an emerging technology. Should we as a country also jump right into it because we don't want to uh, be behind, so to, so to speak? Or should we really focus on using the resources that we have, which is our 4G right now, which is also not really at the maximum where it's supposed to be? Should we focus on um, utilizing the resources that we already have and making sure that at the maximum level and also focusing on universal access or should we also jump into the ship of 5G where everyone is like, okay, we're going 5G now. We also don't want to be left behind. Do we also have those applications that will use this kind of technology? Should we jump to 5G? I, I think, I mean, it's not, it's difficult to say, you know, yes or no. I think you'll invariably find development is always going to be a little bit asymmetric. There may be instances where there will be value going into the 5G space and you'll derive efficiencies and speeds and whatever else, particularly in business or where the, you deal with a lot of data. And so there'll be value perhaps moving in that space. But whilst you do so, you need to be looking at those that are still struggling to get to 2G. You know, what do you do? And as a regulator yourself, I suspect, that's where the public interest and the regulator authority should step in to ensure that whilst others are moving to 5G, we don't leave others completely out. So that uh, hopefully at some point, you know, the, 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 the gap between those that have, uh, I mean, the haves, as you would call them, and the haves would narrow. But it's, it's certain there's value in sometimes stepping ahead and, you know, being ahead of the game but also ensuring that those at the lowest have some access. I think if I had been, I mean, BTCL uh, CEO at some point, well, I'm fortunate it has strictures in terms of, it's a government entity. But if it had been a private ent ent entity, instead of when you are third uh, licensed public telecommunications organization, rather than trying to follow Mascom and Orange and their 2G, they would have been better off starting at 3G because they would have been the first and therefore, and go backwards. But, you know, well, they've missed the boat on that. So, you know, you need to look at the business environment exactly. I mean, if a private entity would be much easier to move that way and then build a business around that and obviously come back to the older technology. Thank you. Now is the time for companies to start thinking about the vulnerabilities of the fourth industrial revolution and the ever-expanding Internet of Things will expose to us. And we've heard about that this morning right here. According to the World Economic Forum's 2019 report, Global Cyber Risk Report, cyber-related risks has now taken positions four and five amongst the top global risks. And those include major risks like drought and terrorism, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. 
urgent action is needed to address these growing risks. We need to address the risks, and again, we have talked about that. However, my opinion is that these risks from the fourth industrial revolution, the threats from cyberspace, is not only or will not only be aimed at companies, it will also be aimed at ordinary citizens and workers. And therefore, everybody going into a career or having worked in a career for, for some time must be prepare, prepared to protect themselves in this new environment. Ladies and gentlemen, you know as well as I do that the whole concept of, of interconnectedness, everything will be interconnected to everything else. And we're seeing that and we're going to see more of that. There was a talk just now in one of the uh, breakaway sessions showing how the number of sensors or, or things in the internet will grow over years, over the next few years. So everybody will be touched. Everybody will, will feel the effect of this interconnectedness more and more. Another quote, you might think of cybersecurity as a specialized niche area or a niche career, not a skill that the average person should learn. But that's wrong. That's not the case. In an age where we manage more and more of our lives digitally, it means that anyone in any career should know simple things about keeping security up to par. Everybody. Even the, the grandmother and the, and, the, and the mother from this morning and the school child must learn and understand the basic things to be a secure driver in this area. And one way of doing this, there are many ways of ensuring that people are prepared to do this, is uh, that everybody is involved with the products, with the products and the output of the fourth industrial Re revolution as the necessary education, training and skills to lower these relevant risks. This will mean that everybody designing, developing and using the products of the fourth industrial Re revolution must have knowledge, training and skills required to create a secure environment and to use the systems in a safe way. We're going to see that. We're seeing it more and more. We're already seeing it. And that therefore brings us to the absolute core aspect of cybersecurity capacity building. Cybersecurity capacity building is essential to manage the risks that will grow in terms of the fourth, and already I've seen papers on the fifth industrial revolution. We talk about robots, we talk about autonomous cars, we talk about uh, medical devices which make decisions for themselves, we talk about artificial intelligence. Specifically end users, people sitting at the end of a computer terminal or with a smartphone in their hand or whatever new sensors we're going to see, must understand the risks that they are exposed to and ensure that they are knowledgeable on how to manage these risks. That is part of the whole concept of cybersecurity capacity building. Today, another quote, today we are all on the front lines of the digital battlefield. Cybersecurity is now everybody's problem, affecting our lives, our livelihoods, and our way of life. And again, there was an interesting pr uh, presentation at one of the breakaway sessions about companies who do not see the future and who go bust. That, and that will also hold for individuals, individuals who don't understand the risks and just carry on in this unsafe environment and who will go bust, bust literally go bust. Better cybersecurity skills and knowledge will lower cyber, cyber crime. That's an important aspect. If the secretary sitting in front of a terminal and having access to the financial statements of the company, if she's aware of a phishing attack and know how to handle it, she will not fall for the attack, most probably. But if she's not aware or if he is not aware and he falls for the cyber risk or the phishing attack, 
that may result in the company's assets being stolen or compromised. In other words, resulting in cybercrime. So I've got no doubt about the fact that increasing cybersecurity awareness, increasing cybersecurity skills will lower cybercrime. I think what, as developing countries, one thing we need to deal with is come up with strategies. Come up with strategies, implementation, implementable strategies uh, for the fourth industrial revolution. We need to start it now, but at the same time, closing the gap, the gap that uh, we missed in the third um, industrial revolution. I'm, I'm quite excited and I'm quite happy uh, because uh, I don't know how to say this without risking my, my employment uh, life, but the fact that our president in the last month or two has been talking connectivity for all, you know, connectivity for all. I think it's exciting. And that connectivity, the fora, he was uh, presenting them, were basically engagements. You know, it's quite funny, even this year, we wanted to connect some, from Buffinet, some businesses with fiber. And some of them refused. They said, no, you are going to be messing up my flowers and my pavement. <laughs> And one of them, just on the eve of the Easter, a boom, a problem with their wireless solution. He came begging at my office, oh, no, please, you know that extension that you didn't want to do, please come and do it. We did that at, at his cost, because it's a, it's a lodge. Over the long weekend, him paying the overtime as punishment from me specifically. <laughs> but, Immediately after the president, the president, the first engagement with uh, uh, Mr. Strive Masiwa, people were saying a lot of things, but the positive, big positive that I got from that, the discussion on connecting the household with broadband connectivity, which is core to Botswana uh, fiber networks. And we talk about sustainability. We can't talk about sustainability if we, we don't address the issue of inclusion and the fact that we've been given targets to share with, with yourselves. Uh, Bofinet has been given a target by 2023, uh, depending on the funds. But we, we are able, we're capable of doing that to connect uh, all the, the household, to have universal, affordable, I must say that, affordable, good quality uh, connectivity to the home, and, and, and the individual. Um, Botswana's environment at the moment, we, 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 we are quite behind us, as is the case with other uh, African countries or developing countries. But I feel we can, we can fill that gap. Um, for the uh, services that we provide, the internet that we, services that we bring into Botswana, I think probably local content in the mix, um, less than 5%. And that 5%, basically, when we get the, the rest of the 95% from outside Botswana, there is a challenge to a risk of our economy not sustaining that. And, and the only way to mitigate against that is we develop content internally. And obviously, the fourth industrial revolution has aspects of uh, internet of things. Um, uh, basically, your water meter being connected, uh, robotics, the automation issues using uh, machines uh, cleverly, uh, intelli uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we have the big data, basically big data. Your, the information, the level of um, um, the information that we have in government and private sector that we need to automate. But what is the starting point? Normally, uh, an organization like Buffinet would say, no, government hasn't started at the bigger picture to talk about, to address issues of uh, big data or digitalization. I think if you start as an organization, BAC itself, if you want to be a center of excellence, you can have a project for digitalization for yourself. And then the approach is once you perfect it, you, you know, you, you, you can even be, do consulting for other um, organizations. I think um, yeah, it's quite important 
that we do this uh, together. But the content part, the content part, which we can uh, easily uh, get through the digital edition of all the information that we have before we even talk about the automation and the, the, the e-services, is quite, is quite uh, important. What I didn't get, um, Professor, is a sort of a, <clears throat> a sense of the breaches that have been going on in cyberspace that has caused you to be so paranoid, as you mentioned. Uh, what, 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 are, what is the statistics saying? Uh, frequency, size, and, and, and just the breaches, a sense of the breaches probably could put the whole thing into perspective so that we could um, uh, track with you in terms of why it is so crucial. Not to say I'm dismissing it as not crucial, but just to have a better appreciation of, of the of this uh, of the um, security emphasis that you are putting out, and then um, related to that, what are the sort of future skills that you see going to be needed to cope in this new era of uh, cyberspace and managing the risks of cyber uh, sec around cyber security? Uh, 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 the risk of cybersecurity and so on. What sort of a future skills? Because clearly you are involved in the education uh, business, um, and you mentioned those reskilling, upskilling, and and so on. You know, what are you currently doing, or what sort of future skills do you see? We need to start focusing on uh, now so that we can prepare our next generation for that environment which you are worried about as well. So maybe just your feedback on those two areas. At the national level, at the national level, I think it's important to be aware that governments are advised or compelled to have cyber security within the national, as, as a national agenda issue. That's why you have uh, uh, structures like SET, uh, computer emergency response uh, technical teams, and cyber security uh, strategies. I think given in, in the Botswana situation, even though we're slow to start it, we should even have in, uh, security operating centers, what they call uh, SOCs. Where we, we, we sit as a, a carrier of carriers for internet, there are a lot of intrusions, hourly, minute by minute intrusions, a good number. And I think uh, uh, if I knew, I, I think it's between five to 10 percent. It's only that a lot of work is being done by operators to, develop, to block a lot of those, and you are not able to see them. But at the national agenda level, all the service providers, especially banks, uh, institutions, corporates, and they should have the responsibility for making sure that they have security team, uh, tools that protect their, their businesses, their customers, and their, their employees. And cyber security training should be part of your agenda as, as an employee and as an, uh, as an employer. And as an employee, I think when you are given that opportunity, Take it uh, seriously because it's quite, it's quite important. But we agree we're on the balance with the prof, I think. <laughs> where we are going, we're actually going to a, a, a situation where we are paperless. There will be no paperless. And you, you can actually see that digital, 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 digitalization is actually permeate all spheres of life. From that diagram, you can actually see that Digital become the central or the, the, the drive of almost everything. You can actually see that in banking, in insurance, in health, tourism, industry, and in everything that's digital. We are talking about the disruption that if we are not careful, we are lagging, we'll be lagging behind. Now the question is now, what is it, what is, what is the technology has to do with become accounting? Is it relevant to talk about accounting at this point in time? It is for sure, because many researchers, they've actually pointed to the notion that 
There is introduction of Bitcoin. There is introduction of blockchain. There is also digital currencies which, which are coming in. And if we are still in the old system, in the conventional system, where we are talking about debit and the credit, we are still not relevant. We are actually producing graduates which are not globally re qualified or re re relevant. So in other words, we are simply saying, what should be the institution of higher and tertiary learning do? Because there is a mismatch that, is, that has been uh, discovered in the curriculum that we are actually graduating our, our become accounting graduates, but are they really relevant in the fourth revolution? Or else there are still some, some, some skills that are still to be addressed in our curriculum. So by the same token, many researchers, they pointed out that uh, industry, they have something that they are expecting graduates. But our, our institution, they are also producing something that may not confine with the, what, the industry. And you'd find out that, uh, you'd find out that many researchers, many of the researchers, they concur to the idea that they need to revamp the curriculum such that the, the, the graduates that we are producing, they are relevant, they are ready for the fourth industrial revolution. And we, when we are saying re ready, you would find out that many people or many graduates, they are not employed. It's not that they are no jobs at times. There are jobs out there, but they are, they are thinking that Botswana or South Africa is their only boundary. But when we train institution of higher learning, when we are training students, we are, we are training them to become globally candidates. Henceforth, they, can, they should actually fit anyway. So if, if we are not actually addressing this aspect of, of digitalization in our curriculum, they will still be redundant in the tomorrow's world. And henceforth, we are actually calling upon the policymakers to try to review the, what, their curriculum and henceforth addressing this skill gap. What then is the opportunity for Africa when you talk about platform businesses? Uh, because we are in Botswana, we're talking in the context of Botswana to Africa, we like to set Botswana as the digital gateway into the rest of Africa. And I believe platform businesses are the right tools to deliver that and to make that possible. Just to give you um, where, a, a picture of where the opportunities are, Africa's population in 2018 was 1.2 billion people. Out of those 1.2 billion, 700 million are active as we speak currently online. 700 million. This entire, um, the annual growth of the people that are active online is expected to grow by 20% in 2019 and will continue, the, the total user base of people that are online will expect to grow by 20% in 2019. And this is expected to grow quite rapidly going forward. In the context of Botswana, um, when you're talking about uh, digital, um, the number of people that are online, which amount to 900,000 people approximately, that are currently active online, they're expected to grow by 17% in 2019. That goes to show you that 40% of the population is online. Now, if we know that all business is happening online and that's where it's going and that's where commerce is going, um, it is in our own interest to start exploring how to bring all of that business online. And I've already spoken about this, 900,000 Botswana online. And that being the case, how we are going to bring all of this business online, I'd like to talk about native platforms. These are examples of native platforms. LRMG is part of a consulting group that operates that is across all of Africa. We are pleased to be, to be partners with this company that is basically consulting for 95% of companies listed in the stock exchange. And in this regard, being part of that group and being part of that, those consultation efforts, um, we are trying to replicate the same success in Africa. This company here in Tekken is an online advertising company that basically delivers advertising similar to what your, well, um, through different publishers, through mobile apps, through one um, solution in that in the, uh, that that's basically serves as a platform, and what we did at Integrale is we realized that as we went to the market, engaging different clients, say, hey, can you come and advertise with us? This and this and that, we quickly realized something: publishers and the clients. Publishers in this case are the supply side, and the clients, the advertising clients in this case, are the demand side. That demand and advertising service. We quickly realized something: there was a problem. 
they didn't understand what was going on there. So what started happening is we started having to educate them on digital transformation. That is how that company there, LNG, um, started transforming itself into a digital transformation consultancy, which is what, how we are converting um, what the success that is, we've had in South Africa with the JSE, we're translating um, this side into Botswana. Uh, so look at our case studies. We talked about publishing. So here's what we found out as we started engaging with the publishers. The publishing industry, is no secret, is declining. The guys are going out of business. They are practically obsolete. They've, they've not transformed. They've not been making, well, in, in the context of local industry, um, they, uh, they, they have made some kind of efforts to go digital, but most of the ways they've gone there, they're totally wrong. So what we found out that 94% of those local digital publishers, they are not digitally transformed and they're not ready. And we also found that um, the market is rejecting print publishing. Traditionally, print publishing businesses make their money from advertising. That's what they basically do. So what they have been doing is they've been trying to take what happens in print advertising and translate it onto online. And they quickly found out that that does not work. It will be, it's a basic complete failure. So what we did is we designed this platform called Anamisa, which what it does is it aggregates content, it also aggregates advertising content, and then it distributes it through different publishers. Um, a publisher in this case is a website, it's a mobile app, it's anything that is audience facing. If you are a developer, for example, um, you design your app and then you come to us, you plug into our system, it distributes advertising through you, you start getting paid. The same thing with publishers, that's basically how it is. In that regard then, Anamisa on Tekele in that regard is a platform business that enables businesses to transact on it and to um, realize its, its, its business objectives. When we first started, software companies were set, set up by technology people, people who were at their computers coding and they would build something and it would be lovely and technical and shiny. And they would assume everybody in the whole world would want to buy their lovely, technical, shiny baby. But actually, they didn't because they didn't understand the marketplace. They didn't understand how to penetrate that marketplace. They didn't understand how to price their product. They didn't understand how to scale their product. So we had to support those technical people with business skills. Much more now so, we're seeing people who've come out of business, people who've seen a problem and realized that problem pr could probably be sought, could probably be um, overcome by some form of software or some form of technology. And actually, it's those people who've got the little black books of contacts, who know the industry, they know how to price things, they know how, where, where the buyers are, they know how to ring the buyers, they, they've got the telephone numbers of the buyers. And actually, it's those people who can raise seed finance really easily. So I, I, I kind of on a weekly basis see these people coming through. And they've got offers of quarter of a million, half a million pounds to set their business up. But the first thing they have to do with that funding is find somebody technical to build it for them. And this is where a real problem occurs because if I'm not a technical person, but I've articulated a problem and there's a technical person over there who says, I'll build it for you. They end up building something that I don't really want because there's a disconnect. They speak technology language. I speak business language and the two don't work together. So Sunderland Software City sits in the middle of that conversation and helps technical people and non-technical people talk together to build truly good businesses. Um, and, and what we want to do with technology businesses now is get them ready to look at new marketplaces. So the third point down where, where I'm preparing new businesses to grasp the demand side, what I'm doing is I'm educating them about new sectors. So a software company that's traditionally worked in the real sector might be entirely valid to sell into the mining sector, to sell into the manufacturing sector, but we need to make them aware of those different sectors. We need to make them aware of the challenges those sectors face, and we need to help them understand the language those sectors use. So a little bit of a, an aside story of that, we did work with a very big software company that essentially did asset management for our national rail. So what did they do when I asked them? We did a bit of a planning session with their, with their directors. And ultimately, we worked out their software was very good at managing long bits of metal, i.e. railroads. And they said, but we've sold domestically to everybody we can. And there are some markets internationally we want to go and explore, but we don't know if we can diversify. So we sat down and we said, well, your software is really good at managing long bits of metal. We said, who else has got long bits of metal? And then they suddenly realized all of the oil network, the gas network, the electricity network, 
all wanted to manage these long bits of metal. I'm dumbing it down slightly, but you get where I'm coming from. And what happened was they tried to start selling into those different sectors, but they were using real language to sell into a different sector and it didn't work. So we had to help them understand the new terminology that they had to do. What the problem they were solving was exactly the same thing. The software, software they were selling was exactly the same, but they just had to use a different language to sell it into that marketplace. So that's the supply side. That's, that's what we do under the Software City banner. We grow businesses. In the Internet of Things, uh, we have maybe four stages. We, we collect information, whichever way we, we can collect it. Then we have to communicate that information. Okay? We do analysis on, on that information, and then you take action. Pretty much that's it. Um, how you collect that information, various sensors, um, we have machine vision, we have position, location, we have motion, uh, humidity sensors, acoustics. We even have chemical uh, sensors, flow meters, um, load, at, at, at B3, we are involved, let me go back to the, to the chemical sensors. At B3, we are involved in um, creating a sensor that, in partnership with a company in, in the US, that they will inject that sensor in a human body and they will pick up the full body chemistry of that individual. That they're already doing it, it's just that their, their, their material that they're using is, is not of the same quality as we can produce here. Now, they're in the US, and they're, they're requesting help from us here in Botswana. Right, so once you've captured the information, uh, your cell phone, your camera, whatever, um, the wearables, then you need to communicate it somehow. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, communication protocols and sensors that, that sorry, um, devices that you can use to communicate that information. All the way from your Bluetooth um, to uh, Wi-Fi. I see LTE at, at the top. Uh, what I found interesting about this, this picture is, is that um, interplanetary network, you see that? Right? You remember there, there was, there was um, Okay, maybe let me go to Elon Musk. Someone talked about Musk yesterday here. He wants to send a spaceship uh, and, and have people vacation uh, somewhere in space. You want to be communicating with those people, I get it. So, so uh, you will be getting information from that spaceship coming in here. You can do analysis. We can try to locate it again. But uh, what, what uh, we are used to is, is the, the, the area networks from uh, personal all the way up to wide area networks. But for your, your IoT to work, you need to have information coming all the way from the sensor that, that you have in, in, in your trees, in your plants, right? all the way to where you can do analysis. And for, ana for analyze, you want to visualize the data, you want to write your reports, uh, filter the data, and ultimately make a decision. Right? right? You, you, have to do, you, have, you have to make a decision. The, the decision can be between machine to machine, uh, communicating those sensors, communicating themselves. Um, I've heard a lot about, uh, what is it called? The fourth industrial revolution. Um, I don't know, the fourth industrial revolution, it's, it's, it's just another buzz. You know, whatever is happening on, on, on that revolution has been happening for years. The key, the key thing there is, is artificial intelligence and, 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 and robotics. There's an opportunity here that I want to highlight that digitization is still a very much viable 
opportunity for, for graduates if government were to unlock that and say, we'd like to digitize, can you come and take this data and actually, obviously uh, issues of how to clean up the data once you've captured it, all that, that's a lot of work, someone has to do it. If it's not done by us, who will do it? Because we can't pretend our country just started. We have data that should inform a lot of the trends that, uh, you know, legacy data. Uh, and and we would be losing out if we fail to realize that we have data sets that proceed, you know, the, the, that come or came before we figured out that we wanted to capture things on a computer. So, uh, the, and then there's digitalization. Now, digitalization, now you want to, having captured the data, you want to automate, certain automation, you know, I think BRS is doing something around, you can now file online. This is the, the you know, the, the, there's uh, the digitalizing the process of how you file and how you obviously claim for certain things. Now, it's not enough, I think, and I'm not just speaking to government because even some companies um, are still not yet. You're filling out forms paper-based they're still not yet embracing digital or ICT. So uh, as, as a country, we're still finding quite a bit of a challenge there. Now, there are reasons each can give, but it's not happening. So that's, that's fact, right? Or at least not happening at the right pace. Uh, the, what happens next after, obviously, you, this is the transformation. This is where you're having fun. Uh, business models that you'd look at, uh, you know, it's happening in the rest of the world, just maybe not, uh, you know, it's not happening here. We, we don't have enough activity uh, that is, how many digital companies are we aware of in Botswana? You can raise your hand and say if you know. Zero. How many digital companies do we know of? Botswana digital companies. Sorry? BTV? Okay. Is a national broadcaster. Okay. Uh, but the point I'm making simply is how do we then transform the country through digital if we don't have companies? You know, indigenous companies, I like what, what they, uh, Dan said, uh, that are part of that. We shouldn't still be looking to buy if we're looking to, you know, to be a part of uh, this, this uh, fourth industrial revolution. If we want to actively be a contributor in what happens next. Now, it's not for technology's sake. It's rather how are we embracing technology to address some of the, the challenges we're having. Uh, you know, Botswana has its characteristics of the population dis, you know, uh, dispersed, not, not volume, but rather the disparity, the distance between. So logistics are a challenge. Can we leverage digital to, to close those? Instead of someone traveling long distances to learn that the medication that they need is not in stock, couldn't they have been engaged whilst still at home, at least to try somewhere else? Or could it have even be delivered? Uh, just the top layer, we're educating people to be innovative, entrepreneurship, skills. Again, uh, we, we, we spoke about that earlier, skills development. But the, the second point of innovative companies and innovative government, it's still not yet happening where they're embracing digital and innovation. So. If we're going to innovate and participate in the 4IR as sellers, it's important that we would have developed, tested local, and whether it's a pilot, not necessarily for money exchange, and exported with a big client under our belt saying, someone in Botswana, be it a corporate or government, has tested this innovation, and it will work for you. Thank you very much. You need to go out. And our tourism needs to be diversified. This is the key. We need to diversify our tourism. And 
Stop thinking that tourism is all about elephants and lions and buffaloes. There's a lot of tourism that can happen in Tamara, wherever we are, because the, 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 the life and the culture of individuals contribute to tourism. Why can't we use ICT to let those people in, 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 in Okavango, wherever they are, to promote their culture and we market it? Somebody should one day get into a plane to say, I'm going to Africa, particularly Botswana, to go and review how the Bahia people are living. And they put food on the table. And we are not promoting that. When we talk about tourism, we worry about animals. Uh, the other thing that we look at, uh, there's also limited participation by what those communities. They're not participating. They are spectators. They are watching things are happening in their face. They are watching money being made in their face. But they're not, they're not, they're not benefiting more than participating. And, and there's this what's called a blanket kind of approach that we are doing to say, whenever we say people are participating, we are calling a quota meeting to say, guys, we are going to develop tourism here. And then you say, society have participated. No, participation means being a decision maker. Not to have a spectator. It's like I'm calling a football match. I'm playing, I've got 12 players. The people who are watching, they're not participating. They're watching. They're supporters. And I'm saying, people who are living in, the, in those areas, you go to San Kuyo, we name them. They must stop being spectators. We must facilitate to ensure that they participate and benefit from the tourism taking place in their respective communities. Uh, poverty levels are high in Maung and heavy vicinity. And not only in Maung, it's only that the studies focus in Maung. Go to Kasane, go to Kasungula. People are living in extreme poverty. And we are saying that tourism is, is a second contributor. And we are even pro prospecting to be the first contributors that means to come, especially the closure of the mines. And we are not looking at the livelihood of those, those people who are the host. And that's where we're getting it wrong. Because it's, okay, also something is important to minority, but it's not important to majority. It should be. Those people who are living there should be the ones benefiting more than us. Okay. Ah, sorry. Okay. Let's look at let's let's look at the prospect of tourism. Uh, this animal called tourism does it does it have potential to help people as we as we as we are complaining? The question, the answer is yes. It can grow small business, but the question is that how are they going to market their business? I can ask, even people from Botswana here asking, how many people do you know who are making the basketry, for example, in, in Okafango? You don't know. And you don't, you don't know and you don't care. <laughs> you can tell me how many, how many elephants we have. That one you can tell me. How many buffaloes we have. But how many people are making the, how many people are, are making basketry in, in Okafango? Or who are culture? Sometimes we become ashamed of our own culture because we have been what? We've been brainwashed. And, but culture is something that we can create employment. <coughs> but we believe that employment can be created by elephant and buffaloes. That is wrong. Hey, that's why I'm promoting cultural tourism. Let people embrace their culture. Let us use ICT to market this culture. Imagine somebody in Europe, somewhere. I mean, I always watch a BTV. When they show in the morning, they go, there's a program, they call it Tabo Janala, which is tourism. They will just pick a well-established lodge. These are rooms. We are offering coffee, offering this. I've never seen them saying, this is how our girls or our boys are dancing. Look, come and watch them. Then how are we saying we are developing tourism? Yet we are living. People who are concerned, well, the concerned people. That, that's, that's the problem that we have. Uh, traditional cuisine. We feel that when people eat their tradition, when you eat much in Japan, Japan, three, like, for example, when somebody says, when you talk about a tree, have you ever seen any promotion about a tree? No. But you know that the tree is common in Maung. Why can't we have that tree? Somebody go and taste that tree and pay a lot of money as you are paying a lot of money in hotels, eating rice and, 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 other, and other food. Look, talk about what? Village tourism. In other countries, there's what called township tourism. Why can't we go and promote it through ICT? We go during plowing season, somebody is using the ox and donkeys to plow. And we go and pay to view that, to view that thing happening in front of us. We, we think those who are using cows and donkeys to plow are uncivilized. We must all use tractors. We forget that this plowing is part of our culture. We are saying our culture is rubbish, we are throwing it in the dustbin. Let's wait for the culture from the, 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 the developed countries, machineries. No, 
Let's promote our culture. Hey. Um, when it usually comes to such aspects where culture now gets involved, we usually find that because it's an, another factor where we see why a lot of our information is still paper-based and <coughs> digitized. So now, don't you think also your research should also be based around the fact that when you're now talking of incorporating ICT, mm. don't you want to now put the education of intellect and IP in between that just to make sure that you don't take away what it belongs to people and give the rights to someone else? Yeah. And now that we can come between the IT, because once the IT comes in, you might find yourself the rate at which mm. it grows. You've lost some people there in their rights. We should avoid over-exploitation, of course, because or, when there's, there's money involved, some people will tend to fake. But we know that, particularly in Botswana, we know that there are certain aspects of culture that are what are inclined to this particular tribe. That one we know. And then we should also try to protect such and look at authenticity as well. <coughs> that is very important. Um, as it has been said, uh, it is important for institutions to have uh, institutional IP policies. The reason being that um, ownership of intellectual property as a basic, when it comes to copyright, the one who creates the work is the one who owns, according to the law of Botswana, and I think uh, quite a number of countries as well. And when it comes to patents, the patent law of Botswana provides that if uh, IP is created under employment, the employer owns IP. Then the question that we asked ourselves is, if you are in a, an academic institution, you are offering teaching, is it assumed that your uh, lecturers, when they come up with new inventions, you own it? Because you hired them to lecture, you didn't hire them to innovate. But in the process of their lecturing, they do create uh, innovations through research that they conduct. Therefore, it is important for institutions to have IP policies that define issues of ownership so that when it comes to IP rights, when IP is generated, there is no conflict between the institution and the IP owner, the, the, the creator of IP. So what we did with the, with the universities that we looked at, we checked what, what do their policies provide when it comes to issues of ownership. As we can see, for a number of institutions here, they have made it very clear in their policies to say any IP created under employment or through research as a student is IP that is owned by the university. They've also defined, because sometimes institutions are funded by third parties, angels, like we said, we had this morning. The issue is that you have to define in your policy as to who owns the IP. So the issue of defining IP ownership is very critical in the IP policy. That is one thing that we found out throughout across the institutions that we, we checked, we researched against the IP, the WIPO model that we talked about. The, the, the factors or issues or areas whereby I feel that maybe the institutions are cheating the, the workers. Uh, because for example, it's not well defined. They say as long as you're working for this organization, whatever you're producing belongs to us. And the question is that what if I produce that during my holiday and uh, I'm on holiday? That's the first question that I'm asking, because I'm using my time by then. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, what if, where it's permissible, I'm working for two institutions, one part-time, one full-time, who owns it at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's not, it's not uh, clearly uh, defined to say that uh, up to this line. Especially, I, I'm, I'm only having, I'm, I'm worried about the fact that if the, the institution didn't sponsor me doing that, coming up with that innovation, and I did it in my own space. It's, it's, a, it's a problem because what if I leave the institution and I want to use it elsewhere? They say it belongs to us. Because those areas, they need, those are gray areas that need to be, to be cleared. That is why it is important for the institution to have its policy. Because the policy will clearly define under what circumstances does the university own the IP? And under what circumstances can the researcher own the IP? Under what circumstances should uh, the IP that is created by an employee of an, an organization belong either to the researcher or to a third party. So if you look at the institutional IP policies and the, the WIPO model that we talked about, it basically provides that guidance. So the only challenge that we have in terms that makes us feel cheated is because these things are not well defined before we reach a point of having an invention and I'm taking ownership, the institution is taking ownership and there was no prior guidance.
So that is the, the, the problem. Before we can actually start talking about um, improving security in cloud computing, let's first find out what cloud computing is. Cloud computing can be defined as the act of utilizing a network of remote servers facilitated on the internet to store, oversee, and process information rather than on a local server. So now that we understand what cloud computing is, let's now go to the issue of security. Why should we have, why should we improve our security in cloud computing? As we all know, security is a major issue in the IT industry. Hence, it also comes particularly serious in cloud computing. According to Naik and Damaha in 2016, they stated that Amazon's simple storage service was interrupted twice in February and also in July 2009. And also, in March 2009, security vulnerabilities were found in Google Documents and this led to leakages of user private information. So in order to avoid these type of situations, it is important for us to find security measures and put them in place so that we, our information won't get leaked. In this area of uh, improving cloud computing security, there have been many researchers who have tried um, to come up with solutions to solve this problem. And we are going to discuss some of those uh, few methods that were proposed. Uh, we're going to look at the encryption algorithm, the modified attribute-based encryption mechanism, and also cloud computing adoption framework. Okay, we'll start with the encryption algorithm. Uh, this <coughs> algorithm was proposed by Karit in 2015. And um, finding on this, findings on these encryption, uh, encryption algorithms show that before you can upload your files, um, they must be encrypted. And also, this, doing this ensures that there is confi confidentiality and integrity of upload, uploaded data such that the data can only be accessed upon successful authentication. Uh, with this algorithm, only the authorized users can gain access to it. A research or an experiment was conducted to check how this proposed algorithm would work. And this table here shows um, the results of the time taken when uploading a file and also the time it takes to download a file. Uh, from this, we can see that um, time to upload a file is lesser than the time taken to download a file. The time to download a file is much greater than uh, the upload one because uh, at this stage, when downloading a file, um, there has to to have, there's a key recovery process that happens, and hence it also adds on to the time of downloading. What is an IoT? IoT is nothing but an embedded sense, embedded system with internet enabled communications unit. Okay, along with that, a GPS unit if possible. Why not? Okay, so. Uh, The criteria for design of an uh, IoT is number one criteria is the most obvious one, fitness for purpose. What is it meant to be used for? Okay, so the next one is power. Power is the mo second most, sometimes the most important criteria. How do you feed power to the device so the device can be active and working anytime, all the time? Okay, so. If you had put a hot pacemaker, you can't pull it out at any time you want, okay? So you need to power it up. Area could be important, volume could be important, weight and the sensing units and the power of the sensing units and something need to be hidden, something need to be explicitly opened up, all those things and many other criteria, but these are the dominant criteria. So, uh, so an IoT is an embedded system, 
may be a non-embedded system, it could be a distributed system, heterogeneous system, real-time system, what not. IOTs can communicate bi-directionally. They are geo-aware, okay? And they can take decisions on their own. And if possible, they can come together as a dynamic team and work together as a dynamic team to achieve a certain goal. So the IOTs in your body can join together and conspire against you too. Watch out. Okay. So Internet of Things, they are available all over. Look at this thing magic here. It's a jacket. Can you have an Internet of Things in a jacket? Yeah, pretty easy. A jacket can measure your body temperature and, and do what? You need nanomaterial for that. Nanomaterial jacket is one in which the, the mesh width can be adjusted. If it is winter, you adjust the width like this. So it is tight. So which means uh, the jacket is warm. No air can flow in. If it is summer, the width can be adjusted by sending a, an electrical pulse. So which means it is airy. Cotton things are airy. They got a, the width is large. Okay, so that means when you wear cotton, you feel cool in summer. Can we do that with a, a typical nanomaterial IoT jacket? It is available. You know, what used to take 50 years to develop into a corporate, so the world of corporates, most people took about 50 years to become big market leaders. A lot of the tech industry, you can become a market leader in less than five. So if you look at where Airbnb came from or Uber came from or any of the Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, they all became massive corporates in less than five years by levering te leveraging technology rather than um, um, human resources. So you can see, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but you can see how there's been key changes through 1980s when the personal computer came in and computing was ac accessible to everybody. In the 2000s, everybody remembers the dot-com. This is fantastic. Crash. It was, we got too, too far ahead of ourselves with what promises were made and how much investment was made, and it all came crashing down. So we've rebuilt it again. There's many people will think we're heading for another dot-com um, wobble because of the amount of money that companies like Uber have been invested in when it was IPO just a few weeks ago, billions of pounds for a company that has never made a profit and have openly said, we will never make a profit likely. So the world of, of finance is just still getting its head around how you actually make any money um, out of these things. So, so next, that's a little bit about where we've come from and where we're going. And, and you know, the mobile devices and this liberation is fantastic. But I just want to spend a few minutes to look at how the world is developing in terms of technology. Because things are moving faster and faster all of the time. And I think there's great opportunities for Botswana in, in what I'm going to say um, here. So massive growth in 2018. Just to quote some stats, there's a number at the top of the screen, top right. 153 billion pounds was invested in tech scale-up businesses and, and a scale-up business is a business that employs more than 10 people and has growth of more than 20% over two years. Um, but just look at this sort of scale here, 153 billion pounds, and that's up 288% from 2017. So the tech revolution isn't dwindling at all. The tech revolution's accelerating at, at very, very fast pace. Um, and the 153 billion was a record high a record high in investment. Now, if we think about where, um, where that investment's going, um, it's probably no surprise to find out that the United States is, is benefiting from a lot of that investment. So on the left hand of this slide here, this shows you that of everybody that's working in tech scale-ups, the United States are 35% of everybody globally working in tech scale-ups. China, um, as you can see, they have, um, what have I got, 35%. Sorry, US is 35%. China is 19%. Um, and then India and South Korea are equal sort of third place um, with 8.5%. I know Hawaii comes from, uh, Hawaii is, um, sorry, Samsung is South Korean. But I was surprised to see South Korea in there. I was surprised that China was so big. 
And then I wasn't surprised, really. I wasn't surprised when I first saw it. Um, but it's interesting how you wouldn't, you would, you probably would have guessed the United States. You might have guessed China, but you might not have guessed some of those other companies like Japan, Indonesia, Singapore. You know, I wouldn't have put Singapore ahead of Russia. It's, it's interesting. So it shows you where, where, where the industry is investing. But globally, every country is growing. So, so when you look at this data at a lower level, every country is, is benefiting from more investment. And it's not just the scale-ups that are benefiting from more investment. The startups have been invested in as well. So you talked about the angel investors before. Um, people are trying to spot great tech companies sooner so they can get the money in early and make big profits um, along the way. The other thing on the right-hand side of this, which I found interesting, was this is what people are working on. So these are the sort of applications or, or, or services that people are working on the most. So you can see at the top, most of the world's tech startups are based around the e-commerce sector. Now, it's not surprising when you think about the, the rise to fame of people like Amazon. I don't know how much um, online purchasing is done in, here in Botswana. But again, I, I don't go into many stores in the UK. Uh, in fact, most of the, there's a big, big issue in the UK right now. The high street stores are declining at a very, very considerable rate. Big businesses that were been around for 100 years are just disappearing now. You know, a few years ago, wool was disappeared from, uh, from the UK's high street because everybody shops online. So my weekly grocery shopping when I'm buying food, a van drives to my door and drops up at the convenience of being able to do it online on the phone again and having somebody deliver it. So it's not surprising that e-commerce is growing really highly. I was surprised to see how many people are working in cybersecurity. And I was very pleasantly surprised because we've heard yesterday about if we want to really adopt these emerging technologies, we have to get the security right. Now, there's part of me thinks that I need to be sensible. Lots of messages yesterday were very, very important. You would never leave the front door of your house open when you went to work on a morning or came to university. Why would you leave the front door of your phone open? So you need to keep passwords. And even though I called out about 20 different use cases, every single application I use on my phone has a different password. It is a bit of a pain in the backside to keep them managed, but it, it, that's the bit, that's my obligation to trying to keep safe. The rest of the security, I'm trusting to someone else. The, the, is, is Bluetooth secure? I hope so. Um, <laughs> is the internet secure? If it's HTTPS. Um, and if we really, when I was building applications, my, my instruction to my teams back at Sage was secure the data first, not last. Don't secure the device. Well, yes, do secure the device, but it's more important that you secure the data that's on the device. So if you lose your device, people have to try and crack the data. If the data is open and the device is locked, it's easier to crack a device than it is to crack the data. So I used to go at a low level and, uh, and secure that. And so you can see some of the other things, software as a service is any application, really, that is software as a service. Um, Internet of Things, Fintech, we heard a bit about fintech. The banks and financial institutions are really getting to grips with technology. And, and, and your statement was absolutely true. The bank I work for, the bank, some of the high street banks will disappear over the next 20 years. And they will be replaced by financial, um, not by financial institutions, but by financial technology providers that actually help for new, new ways of, um, of transacting and payments. Um, I was surprised to see that there was more people working on automated cars than there were on big data, which is interesting. But I think we're getting into the realms of where you need to check um, some of that data out again. So that's a little, a little vision of what's happening around the world because when I help companies to build strategy, I want to look outside of the UK to see what else is happening. And has anybody else done anything that we can just borrow the ideas from? So, you know, the not invented here is very dangerous um, a dangerous concept. You talked about, you know, using SAP. It's not for every business, but you should never try and write a. You never try and take on SAP. You will lose as a startup. Um, you will. You, you just will. Um, build things that nobody's built yet. That's the way to where. That's the way to really succeed. Really, I think I'm going to use this couple of minutes just as a, as a reflection on what I've heard, 
what I've seen both in this conference and speaking to people outside. And if I play that against a little checklist of what I believe Africa, more importantly, Botswana needs to, to thrive from the industrial re revolution, uh, the, for the fourth industrial revolution, I think it makes sense. So I've got four things on my tick box that I think we need to check that Botswana has. The first is, does it have the policy? Well, we've heard from the minister, we've seen your strategic documents, we've seen that there's a desire to enable things. So yes, I would put a tick against there's a policy in place. It may need, it may need a bit of tweaking, it may need a bit of refreshing, it may need a bit of trying things and moving things, but there's political will. So I'm gonna tick the policy box. Secondly, does it have ambition? Well, I've not met anybody over the last two days that doesn't have the ambition to make ICT an enabling factor in Botswana. So I think you should give yourself a round of applause for that ambition. <laughs> Third place, does it have the partners? Well, I would hope that you would count Sunderland Software City and the University of Sunderland as partners. Um, but I'm sure if you present what you presented over the last two days to other nations, to other corporates, to other universities, to other colleges, to other people who might want to help, you'll get the same response as you do from, from us, which is, wow, yes, please can we part, be part of your journey. So I think partners, you've already got some and you will easily get some more. And then the final thing I would always look at is, have you got a place to start? And I think we had some wonderful discussions around innovation. You've got a desire to connect big companies and small companies. You've got a desire to create more new tech companies. You've got a desire to upskill people. You've got a place to start. And there's, really, there's one that I'm surprised nobody picked up on when we were talking about connected cows. Everybody knows Botswana will soon be the home to the internet of cows. So you've definitely got a place to start. <laughs> and that's all I've got to say, really. I look forward to joining you on this journey. This, this was day one and day two of hopefully which will be a long relationship which will have an impact on Botswana. But, you know, impact us as well. There's some things I've already learned and I'm going to take back to, to the northeast of England. So thank you very much for the invite. I look forward to participating on the journey with you. The fourth industrial revolution is seeded by global connectivity through the internet and mobile phones. Okay, so with that, large-scale knowledge processing is the key for the first, fourth industrial revolution. So, which means we can identify the people who are in need and who can pay who if we deliver just in time, just in case, just in everything, okay? It's possible to make a business and make, make people live better. Now, I know I've, let's, let me not keep you longer, uh, but I'll just try to highlight those um, particular areas um, as, as by way of saying, yes, we have been listening and we take the, the key messages we also will have the documentation together. Uh, before I close off, let me uh, send out some thank yous. One of them is to you, the delegates. Thank you very much. And I think the MC uh, uh, or the panel chair uh, did that um, by way of thanking you for, for being here. And I also started off with that. So again, I will just repeat myself by saying thank you very much for, for the endurance. Um, to all our speakers, a big thank you for coming, for engaging, and for participating in the way we have. To the organizing group, uh, the conference organizers, thank you very much. Um, well done. This is going to be an annual conference, so we expect to be back here sometime next year looking at this. And there are a lot of lessons that we know we have learned from just being the host itself. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in summary, um, thank you, uh, and I officially declare the conference closed. So this has been a fantastic conference. Two days of very informative and enlightening presentations. Um, I've been truly inspired 
I feel full of encouragement and I can't wait until the conference comes back next year. I would love to come back and see progress against some of the key topics that we've discussed this time around. And I wish everybody here in, in Botswana all of the very best in pursuit of those goals. Is Africa ready for a fourth industrial revolution? Um, yes and no. Uh, no in the following sense that Africans need to become thinkers and doers from now on. Okay, There are a lot of technologies available and they need to take them up, they need to work on them, and they need to identify Africa-specific issues and address them at a world stage so, so that the African products and services can become available worldwide and Africa at large can benefit from the fourth industrial revolution. The last two days have been amazing. I've learned so much. Uh, I, I could actually safely say uh, this conference was successful. I got a chance to present a short paper that I wrote and the feedback was great. Um, and not being from an accounting background, it's amazing that BAC was able to come up with something that incorporated not just ICT, but sustainability as well. So uh, I'd just like to say thank you for BAC for, for having us and for giving us the opportunity to uh, experience this and to absorb as much as we did. And I can't wait for the ne next year's conference and I cannot wait to, to also do more work with BAC. Thank you so much. Well, my experiences were throughout the conference. First of all, we'll be getting to rub shoulders with giants giants in the ICT industry, the likes of the Professor, um, Professor Soms, Professor Irons and Professor Dunn. So basically what I got from the conference would be very much about cybersecurity, cybersecurity and how we're quickly moving into the fourth industrial revolution as ICT people. And most of all, well, it was basically an experience being one of the presenters, being able to present my research findings to a vast amount of people and to people who have greater experience in the ICT industry. So this conference was one of a kind and I was very, very glad and I gained very much from being a part of it. Thank you. So we're at the end of the conference now and it's been a fantastic two days. But I think the most impressive thing is this has been day one and day two of a long-term partnership between Sunderland Software City and everybody in Botswana. I've been incredibly impressed by the ambition, by the partners, and I hope to be part of this moving forward. I think Software City can learn a lot from the partners in Botswana, especially the ESC, but I also believe that we can bring a little bit of help and a little bit of guidance towards the ambition and the future of what's going on here. So I look forward to coming back next year and I look forward to a long-term relationship. Um, my experience with the conference, it was amazing. Um, it was more than what I hoped for or what I thought was going to, it was going to be. It was definitely off the hinges, if I may use those words. Um, in terms of realizing its objective, I think it has. In terms of speaking to sustainable development, I think it has. And given the progress that was made, the networking that was experienced, the people, the minds, the thought leaders, the innovators, all the people that we met here, um, it was really awesome and there was really much to gain from it. And this is something I'll definitely attend next year. I'm definitely going to be here and this time I don't just want to attend, um, I think I want to partner. All right. I think I want to partner with BAC on this one, um, help make it more, uh, more interesting. And I also think it will be a good idea that next year to bring more of our local entrepreneurs, um, the guys who are making strides in, techno in, the, in, in tech startups, doing their own businesses, um, struggling, those that have made it, those that have failed, and those that have made it to the top. Uh, bring them here, let's really, let's share and expose each other to the possibilities that we can realize and not just talk about it, but actually move towards um, implementing and make things happen. As we actually come back again next year, we would like to hear or get testimony from all who attended today and all who actually will get access uh, to the information and knowledge that was shared today with respect to what it is that has been done 
tangible, measurable, with full testimony and evidence as to the fact that we really are indeed will be moving forward towards using ICT as a tool that can support sustainable development to create a better world for all of us in terms of food security, in terms of you know a better environment, in terms of more innovative ideas at all levels from primary you know to secondary school to university and and beyond uh, with these few words i say you know thank you very much and i hope you too will feel inspired and as we call upon you hopefully in our day in the next sitting of the conference you will be very eager to come and share and contribute with us as we together work towards creating a better society for all. Thank you very much.